Uh, welkom allemaal. Uh, ik ga het vandaag in het Engels doen, als het voor iedereen oké okay is. It's every, for everybody fine, we do it in English. Yes. Oké. Okay. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, in the connection with the Gödel Escher Bach exhibition, which opened uh, last week Friday, we organize a couple of events. And uh, with these events, we want to give some insight, reflection, and also a discussion about the exhibition. And uh, this public program we call uh, Gödel Escher Bach Collegia. And the exhibition, what we opened last week Friday, is in the connection of the 125 year anniversary of Escher. And there's uh, two other exhibitions at the Kunstmuseum, Escher Andere Welt, in the Escher Museum, the Ontdecker von Escher, and uh, our exhibition called uh, Gödel Escher Bach. The title may be a little bit confusing because our exhibition is not about like a three white men, but it is an exhibition with uh, in total 35 participants from uh, different disciplines, different age, different genders, different uh, a regional region. And uh, we did uh, something similar a couple of years ago with the Bauhaus exhibition. Also there, there was a celebration of 100-year Bauhaus. And uh, back then, the exhibition was called Symptom Bauhaus because what we wanted to do was not so much celebrate something, but reflect on, on a certain phenomena. We also just uh, closed the exhibition 125-year Robson, which is interesting because also This year is the 125 year anniversary of Paul Robson. So I think it's nice to have an exhibition also about Robson, but also in connection with Escher. Another anniversary, what, what, what we also have, is 125 year Malame, because this year it is 125 years ago that Malame died close to Paris. And that's the project which is at the Alpha Beta. And in total, we have six exhibitions, and that's like quite unique. Some, mostly, we have two or three exhibitions at the same time. Now, at the moment, it's uh, six. But yeah, let's come back to the uh, Gödel Escher Bach Collegia. The idea was somehow sparked also by an online session I saw from the MIT College. And uh, they had a, a series of lectures based on the book A Gödel Escher Bach by Hofstetter. And I found that uh, very interesting. So I thought, like, yeah, let's try to do something uh, similar. And for everybody who did not see the exhibition yet, these are the 35 uh, artists participating. And I'm uh, very happy that uh, Richard Cavell is uh, here with us uh, today. And Richard Cavell comes from uh, Canada and is a professor for media studies and is participating with uh, his work in the exhibition. What surprised me a little bit with the exhibition so far is that everybody experienced the exhibition quite different. So in the first review, somebody sees that really as a scientific exhibition. I find that very interesting. As the image for the exhibition. We use this uh, self-portrait of uh, Ernst Mach, which he was drawing in uh, 1880. And um, it's also the, the first item what you see when you enter the exhibition. It's the original book, which we could find from 1880. It's a German book. And on the page, you see the illustration. But what's also interesting is to read the text, which is on the, same, on the page opposite because there he explains how he came to the idea to make this a drawing. So it says like uh, it was about 1817 that the idea of this drawing was suggested to me by an amusing chance. A certain Mr. L, now long dead, whose May eccentrics were redeemed by his truly amiable character, compelled me to read one of C. F. Krauss' writing in which the following occurs. Problem? to carry out the self-inspection of the ego. Solution, it's carried out immediately. 
And in order to illustrate in a humor, humorous manner this philosophical much ado about nothing, and at the same time to show how the self-inspection of the ego could be really carried out, I embarked on the above drawing. So what he says is that this is the most honest self-portrait somebody can do. Because this is what you can see with your left eye. So that self-portrait is also called view from the left eye. Later on, this drawing influenced uh, uh, various people, uh, also Douglas Harding, who um, later on came with this idea of uh, uh, on having a no hat. So he uh, made, uh, became famous with this experiment. I can do it together with you, like you have to take your finger. Everybody takes their finger. Okay. Everybody does that. Okay, where does the finger point to? Exactly. Okay, we do it again. Take the finger. We do it like this. Okay. Where does the finger point to? Exactly. We take the finger, put it like this. Where does it point to? That's the big question. <laughs> and uh, um, if you look on our website, you can see a talk of uh, Tom Short in a context of another exhibition we did about this uh, idea of uh, Douglas Harding. And what I found very inspiring was that uh, Tom Short already teaches uh, Buddhism for like uh, over 40 years. And he introduced this uh, idea of uh, Douglas in his talk and he made exactly what I did. And then he said like the problem is it took him 20 years to find out that this was not a joke. So I'm not there yet, but I think, you know, you just have to uh, consider that there's more behind that you can currently understand. <coughs> uh, our exhibition, Goethe Escherbach, is uh, based on a book by Douglas Hofstetter which was published in 1980, and Douglas Hofstetter won the Pulitzer Prize, an important uh, prize for literature. And uh, probably everybody has a different reading on the book. My personal reading is that uh, the whole book is, after all, about uh, self-reference. And uh, for me, um, the self-reference is something which is creating a, disti a distinction between two things, which are not very easy to... Uh, to name. For Hofstetter, the self-reference is in the book explained as everything which is thinkable, logical, and explainable. And I understand the book that he wrote the book to expand this space, to expand the space, the thinkable space. And he's doing that also with the question if this would enable us to imagine if AI would be possible or not. It's important to realize that the book was published in 1980 and there was a totally different view on AI than today. Also his idea on what he's saying in the book uh, probably changed during the years. But I think that is what the book is uh, about, at least for me. But then if you look like at the outside, there is something. And with the exhibition, we just made the assumption, perhaps, which is, we just say what is outside, the thinkable and the explainable, let's just assume that this is the art. And just the same way as Hofstetter looked at self-reference from the inside, we try to look from the outside. Approach self-reference from the uh, artistic dimension. And by doing that, probably, create another view from the inside, from the thinkable. What I want to say is that at the end, when you look at art, you look at yourself, how you look at art. And the only one who can change that perception is yourself. We can give you the tools, we can inspire you, but we cannot create this change. The change has to be made by a person themselves. If we do an exhibition, which I think is totally uh, inspiring, but a visitor tells me like it's not inspiring for them, I just have to accept that and I just have to keep on trying, but I should not 
It's the person themselves who make, have to make this uh, distinction. And when I uh, had contact with uh, Hofstetter about the exhibition, I also asked him if he could participate. He's like, no, I cannot participate. But then he said, like, uh, uh, as longa vita brevis, which means, like, uh, art is long, life is short, short is life. And in that way, I think it's important also to consider, like, what is art? That's, I think, uh, also an important uh, subject of the exhibition. And uh, in the book by Alexander Gottlieb Baumgarten in 1750, when the term aesthetics was firstly coined, I think more or less he says like that aesthetics could be also regarded as a kind of unsharp truth, which is still a truth, but it's not explainable. So there is something like taste with, where we can agree on, even we cannot explain it. And yeah, that's the question always, like what is art? And this question probably can never be answered. I think most philosophers will agree that it is self-evident that nothing concerning art is self-evident anymore, not its inner life, not its relation to the world, not even its right to exist. And for the exhibition, uh, we made a small uh, audio tour. Uh, you can just uh, uh, listen to that on the, on the website. And what we try to do with these um, with these talks is also to talk about things which are not, uh, which go a little bit deeper. So to get the easy uh, access, I think uh, that would be the way to start. And um, with this talk, we try to evaluate on things. And that's the first drawing uh, Escher ever made, which is still uh, document documented. And I think uh, there you can see that uh, the big um, fascination of Escher probably was not so much uh, optical paradoxes or illusions, but I think it, after all it was this self-reference. Because the hand which is drawing the hand or the waterfall which falls into the water is, are all illustrations of the self-reference. And at the same time, perhaps that's also the reason why um, it was never so much discussed within art history, because what it did is more illustrating, it was an illustration what art could be. But at the same time, the it, it was above all an illustration. With the exhibition, there's a few themes which are um, uh, coming back in, in various uh, works. Uh, one is um, the theme of the cube. Uh, there's a, a theatre play of uh, English mathematician Marcus de Satoy. Um, there's the work of uh, conceptual artist Georg Herold, which is uh, the Escher Cube. Uh, there's also a work from London Field Works, which is a, a hole which is cut into a stone based on the brain activity of Gustav Metzger, another artist thinking about uh, nothing. And uh, yeah, probably that's also a cube. That's the first uh, picture ever made of uh, Angela Merkel doing this uh, gesture. And then uh, uh, 30 years later, the last picture made in the same series. And what's important to know is that uh, Helen de Kölbel, who is a German photographer, uh, she was always fascinated by the idea to see what politics or power does to people. So she approached uh, Angela Merkel in 1989 with the question if she could follow her like for all her career. And then she's like, okay, I agree. So that was the first uh, picture on the left. And then uh, at the end, when, it, when she stopped to be the Bundeskanzler, and that was officially the last picture they made, and then the project was fulfilled because he was not in the position anymore. That's a work by a, a Korean artist, uh, Kim sung -gui, called uh, Vide O. It's a TV made of ice, which is melting in the video. Um, there's also work by uh, uh, Wim Kroll. It's also at the end, I, I think, a, a cube, what he's doing. Like uh, Wim Kroll was a famous uh, graphic designer, type designer, and uh, was also called Mr. Kritnik because he made all, he always wanted to do things in a grid or in a square or in a cube. And uh, there was one moment in his life where he made his first and probably his uh, last calligraphy ever. 
And I think what's nice is even in the calligraphy you see this, uh, his passion for the, for the cube. Another subject which I found difficult to illustrate uh, is uh, dialogue. I don't know if this is representing dialogue. Um, the dialogue happens on, in different ways. We have, uh, for example, two videos by uh, American artist uh, Eleanor Antin. Uh, one uh, which is about a fictive collection of documentary, doc documentation videos of a black dancer. It was an alter ego of herself, which she named Eleonora Antinova. And another video which we show is um, The King. Um, another dialogue we have in the exhibition is uh, between the visitor and uh, a robot. Uh, that's from uh, Louise Clermont, a young German artist, and she made an alter ego of herself and it's uh, in the exhibition and you can just approach her alter ego and uh, talk to her. Another dialogue which I missed uh, to put inside this um, uh, uh, exhibition is uh, an AI uh, dialogue between uh, Shishek and Werner Herzog, which is uh, all generated by AI. And this works very well because uh, Shishek has a very good, uh, unique voice and there's a lot of audio data. And the same goes for Werner Herzog. And so they are doing this, the infinite uh, conversation. Uh, what was interesting, like while we were working on the exhibition, Shishek created reacted on the work in the German uh, newspaper, Die Zeit, and he had his uh, concerns about the AI Shishek, what he was uh, telling. So he said like the AI Shishek was not telling the truth or that he was, would not agree with the AI Shishek. But then uh, the artist back then used the article which was published by the real uh, Shishek and asked the AI Shishek to react again on this one. And once you listen to all that, it becomes very confusing. Uh, I showed that uh, before that the theater play um, that also obviously is a dialogue between two people, but it's also fascinating that it's actually also a dialogue in two parts. The theater play consists out of part one, where they uh, show, um, where they talk about math, where they show, for example, that zero can be one in a theatrical way. But then in the part two, they make something like mathematical theater, where they discuss like what happens if somebody, for example, leaves the stage and comes to back to the stage uh, on the other side. Uh, that's perhaps not obvious why this is a dialogue. That's a work by Yoko Olta, a Dutch filmmaker. Uh, it's a um, documentary of, of a mountain. It's a, where people are climbing the mountain, but at the end, the distinction between the, the mountain and the people uh, somehow disappears. And uh, what's interesting with this work is that it's, uh, it was published or released as a film and then screened at the uh, ITFA, uh, no, EFFR, Rotterdam Film Festival. And quite often films have a short life. They are screened then for one year, two years, then they are forgotten. And I knew about the work, so I invited her to participate then. But also, while we were working on the exhibition, it was more and more picked up also in the art context. So it was also just screened at the ICA, and uh, The Guardian uh, published uh, uh, a review about the film uh, that I found it interesting, that the exhibition also tries to combine works from different uh, disciplines, not necessarily uh, um, established uh, art context. And another dialogue is uh, a work by uh, Richard Cavell, and uh, the song is called uh, the the work is called uh, uh, Speech Song. Speech Song uh, was, I th correct me if I'm wrong, uh, was first published as a booklet. And now for this exhibition, we made a mixed reality uh, production, which is a part of the exhibition. And I think that was my introduction and I'm uh, happy to give the word to uh, Richard. <laughs> Uh, it's great uh, being back in uh, 
Den Haag. Uh, I've been here a number of times. First of all, in 2011, when my friend and colleague Ravi Gantro invited me to lecture at the Institute of Sinology here in Den Haag, a cutting edge uh, institution, as I'm sure you all know, and in the Royal Conservatory a few years ago, some conference. Uh, I've lectured at the university as well, so it's sort of starting to feel like home. Um, I know this is a new space for uh, West, and it's really a remarkable conversion. I think very difficult because you have small rooms rather than great big galleries. And I think especially this exhibition works very, very well in this space because it is so highly juxtapositional. Um, I also want to thank Baruch Gottlieb. Baruch uh, can't be here at the moment, he's in Berlin, but he was the one who created the installation based on my book, Speech Song, so Baruch, Thank you. Uh, I wish you could be here, but um, any, in any case. What I'm going to do very briefly uh, is talk about this book to give you a sort of context about the book and then suggest a way that it relates to this exhibition, Good Lesher Bach. Okay, that's what I'm going to be doing. And then we'll have time for questions, I believe, also. So, um, to get right to the point, what is this... Um, this word speech song, it's a translation of a German word, uh, either Sprechgesang or Sprechstimme, spoken singing or spoken voice. It's largely associated with Arnold Schoenberg, the Viennese composer, um, who wanted to move away from classical musical intonations into something that was perhaps a little more radical, but also a critique of those specific modalities. Um, Schoenberg used it to particular effect in two works, a very funny work, Pierrot Lunaire, 1912, and then a very serious unfinished work, uh, Moses und uh, at the end of his career. And I'll come back to those points later. Um, what are the key points of speech song? Well, Akiem talked about dialogue with reference to Gurlesher Bach, and this is the most important aspect of speech song, now, a number of dialogues here. Glenn Gould, the Canadian pianist most famous for recording the music of Bach, um, lived an entire musical life in dialogue with Arnold Schoenberg. He came to his understanding of music through Schoenberg. He even understood Bach through Schoenberg. So very, very important for Gould. But there's also the dialogue between Schoenberg and Western music. I mean, largely, Arnold Schoenberg inverted the entire Western musical system. It's like Nietzsche rethinking the entire philosophical tradition. That's what Schoenberg did to the Western system. It's one of those great uh, intellectual uh, achievements. And uh, finally, the dialogue between Gould and Bach. What you're looking at here are Gould's notes superimposed on the notes for the Goldberg variations, okay? So he was absolutely obsessed by uh, Bach, and particularly the Goldbergs, which he recorded twice, 1955 at the beginning of his career, 1981 at the end. Uh, but recursion uh, is also a major point uh, in Gurlesher Bach, and uh, recursion can be understood in terms of dialogue, okay? Uh, dialogue is potentially limitless. It's simply two ideas going back and forth, exchange, infinite exchange. Um, ultimately, you will have to close a dialogue off, otherwise it can go on forever, theoretically. Um, thus, it's formed by repeating concepts and extending them. I say something, you reply, I take something that you said and I reply, and it goes back and forth in that particular way. Um, and as I said a moment ago, Gurlesher uh, Bach also uh, focuses on and uses the idea of um, recursion. Now, what why did I write a book about Arnold Schoenberg? I'm not a musicologist, and Glenn Gould. Um, I did because I believed that there was sort of uh, a media history or a media theory uh, in this relationship between Gould and Schoenberg or in the relationship between speech and song. Uh, that was my motivation. Um, you know that um, Schoenberg moves out of the Vienna fin de siècle um, and at that moment, the idea of art 
was giving away to the idea of mediation. Uh, this picks up actually on something Akiem was saying a moment ago. Uh, art no longer becomes the idea of representing something out there, but actually talking about art itself. Art becomes about art. It becomes self-referential. Uh, it becomes inward focused. Uh, because, of course, representation has by this point become very, very problematical. How do you represent a world that, uh, by, by the turn of the century from the uh, 1800s to the 1900s becomes more and more in flux. It's moving rapidly towards the First World War when more or less all social, political, economic, and cultural relations are about to break down. And artists uh, are sensing this and they are, they, are, they are moving away thus from the idea of a fixed universe that they can represent in art to the only thing they have left. It's, it's, it's all the artists had left, which was art itself. And so art started to become about uh, art. Now, in the case of Arnold Schoenberg, uh, his particular take on this shift was the refusal of harmonic resolution. So he said, basically, uh, the Western musical tradition has been based on harmony, but in fact, harmony is not the heart of music. The heart of music is dissonance. Uh, what harmony does is simply close off dissonance. It's the same way as if we were having a dialogue and me saying, well, this could go on forever, but I've got to have lunch, so let's just end it here, okay? Um, and Schoenberg says, uh, well, in fact, um, the musical system is not about harmony. Harmony is simply how you close off dissonance, how you close off that flux, that musical flux. And his particular focus was uh, Richard Wagner, who he had a very contestatory uh, relationship with musically. Um, and he said, all of Wagner works towards harmonic resolution, and I refuse that. I want to make music that is all about dissonance or non-closure, non-ending. Uh, so if you have listened to uh, especially the later atonal works of uh, Schoenberg, it's very difficult to discern how they begin or how they end, or even if they do begin or if they do end. Uh, it's as if they're floating in space somehow, and you have by accident uh, discovered them. And at least one uh, critic has related a tonality to asymmetry, um, to a movement away from symmetry. Um, this is a quote from uh, Dor Ashton, who's written about uh, Schoenberg's uh, atonality in the context of art, because Schoenberg was also an artist. Um, and. Um, Dorashen says that Schoenberg's spatializing diction, even in his mature years, always harks back to the new conception of musical space of the first decade. And Sprechstimme was one such spatial innovation. It's, why is it spatial? Because it refuses a strict point of view, musically or sonically. Okay? You cannot resolve it. It's unresolved. It's undecidable. Um, and that is the connection between uh, atonality and asymmetry, but you can also connect atonality to recursion, which is our major theme with Gödel Escher Bach. Um, Schoenberg's work can be understood as recursive in both the historical and formal senses, a turning back to a previous artistic era, the era before symphony orchestras, for instance, the era of chant, um, and formal senses, a turning back to a previous artistic era as well as the repeated application of a rule, as in his compositions with tone rows, a process that is now familiar to us through computation. Okay. Now, that's, if you, you can read the book for free, Speech Song, if you want to. It's, I published it with open access, so it's, it's online. Just type in Speech Song to Google and it's there. These have been quotations from the book. Okay. Now I'm going to shift gears. Um, to a, um, a PowerPoint called Schoenberg, Gould, Hofstadter. So I'm trying now to relate speech song and Gould and Schoenberg to some of the ideas in Hofstadter's uh, book. 
And I set up this discussion as point and counterpoint. As you know, Bach's music is written in counterpoint, uh, which is like dialogue, musical dialogue. And so I'll start with a point, and then I will, I will remediate or recursify what I just said to you in counterpuntal terms. Okay, so I'll, I'm, in effect, I'm writing this, and then I'm going to unwrite it. Okay, um, so what's the point? Uh, what's the connection between uh, these three artists? Well, there are a number of them. The major point of Gödel-Escher Bach is recursion. I think there's no doubt about that. Uh, but the counterpoint uh, is, in fact, computational media. So as Akia mentioned to you, one of the really amazing things about Gödel-Escher Bach, published 1980, is that Hofstadter is talking about artificial intelligence. Now, today we're talking a lot about artificial intelligence, but this is what, 40 years ago, nearly half a century ago. But the big question is, what's it doing there? I mean, Gödel, okay, yes, he's very important in theorizing computation. Uh, Escher, hmm, it's a little stranger. Escher, what does he have to do with AI? And Bach, almost impossible. What, what could be the connections to artificial intelligence? Uh, so this I find a very, very interesting aspect of the book. I remember reading it as a graduate student um, thousands of years ago. Um, and um, you know, we, no one was talking about AI then. And so this is a very, very forward looking book. And I think that's why it's so important to be having this um, art exhibition at this particular point because we're able to go behind and see what some, one of the early major thinkers about uh, um, AI was talking about. So what is recursion? Well, Hofstetter uh, defines it as stories inside stories, movies inside movies, paintings inside paintings. You might not be able to see that too clearly. Um, I think I saw this about an hour ago over in Moritzwies. Uh, there's something very like this on the second floor. It's, uh, some guy painting a picture but with all of these pictures around, okay? So it's, it's a painting that's about painting, right? So that's recursive. Um, it's recurrence or reoccurring in a different but related form. So these are all paintings, but they're all different. They're all the same and they're all different. That's sort of what recursion is about, okay? Um, it's a form of imitation that produces difference because an imitation is not the thing it imitates. When I was in Moritz Suisse uh, an hour ago, everyone was taking uh, photographs of the pictures. So the photographs become real for them once they're on their cell phone, okay? Um, that's a very, very, very um, uh, contemporary take on this idea of recursion. Uh, recursion is a form of looping, and that's a, one, of, one of Hofstadter's favorite words, is looping, the loop. He loves loops, going around in a circle, okay? Um, making a circle, but you're not exactly repeating because you're making another circle and another circle and another circle. But the interesting thing is there's always a point of crossover. You cross over. The very point, I'll come back to that. Um, and, well, that's just what I said. A point of crossover or, um, in computational terms, uh, interface. Now, uh, recursions are all over the place. They're in nature as well as in culture, okay? Um, and one way we can understand uh, recursion is through the Fibonacci sequence. You may know the Fibonacci sequence. Um, you find it in art, you find it in mathematics, you find it in the shape of books. Um, it's a very simple uh, sequence, but very powerful. Zero plus one is one, plus one is two, plus one is three, plus two is five, plus three is eight, plus five is 13, so on and so forth. It's infinite. Um, it's very, very simple, and yet it's everywhere. It's, you find it everywhere, in nature, interestingly, as well as in culture. Um, I was in Portugal um, a few weeks ago, and I had been reading in preparation the great national epic of Portugal, which is uh, the Lusiades of Camões. And um, I discovered it's very, very interesting. There are 10 cantos, or 10 chapters in the Lusiades, but uh, Camões concludes at chapter seven, or canto seven, why? It's the point of recursion. It's when the circle comes around. And so then you have three extra chapters at the end as a coda, okay? That's how powerful this idea of the, uh, 
of the Fibonacci sequence and interface and, and recursion and crossover is. Uh, in musical terms, a fugue is a recursion. Uh, fugue, of course, very much associated with the work of Bach. Um, defined by Thomas Morley in uh, his 1597 introduction to music as when one part beginneth and the other singeth the same. Uh, we all know what part songs are. Um, Francis Bacon uh, defined it uh, in his book Silva Silvarum, which is a, a book about trees, because of course you will find the Fibonacci sequence in trees as well. And you know the circles in the trees, right? Loops. If you've seen Hitchcock's Vertigo, halfway through Vertigo, exactly halfway through, Hitchcock shows you the circles in a tree. Why? Because that's what his movie is. It's movie filmed twice. Part one and then part two, it's a recursion. That's why it's the greatest film ever filmed, according to the American film critics, right? Brilliant. There, you can't get any more brilliant. It's totally self-enclosed. Hmm? Brilliant. Okay. Um, Bacon calls it figures in rhetoric of repetition and traduction. The word traduction in the 17th century meant translation. As soon as you have the word translation, you're, you're involved in media theory because media theory is all about translation, okay? So recursions are also translators. They translate one idea into another idea, which is what we do when we dialogue. I have my idea, I talk to someone, that person gives me their idea, and then I take that idea and I send it back, okay? Um, translation. It's from the Latin word fuga, to flee or run away, run away from, and fugues are theoretically infinite. Of course, the classic case is Bach's Kunst der Fuge, the art of the fugue, which doesn't end. It doesn't end. Even Bach, the greatest musical composer in the Western tradition, couldn't end a fugue, okay? And what is brilliant about the art of the fugue is he refuses to impose closure. Schoenberg loved that. He absolutely adored it. Okay? it made him very happy that day. Okay, so um, you find fugues all over in art. You can find fuga, um, fugues in literature. Uh, look at the opening lines of the Aeneid of Virgil. Arma virumque cano troiae qui primus avoras Italiam fato profugus leveniaque venit. Okay, look at that word profugus. The flight, the flight. Aeneas is on a flight, he's fleeing. Empire is founded on an absence, flight. Hmm? Um, and that's what keeps the recursion going. An empire is absent, and so empires seek to acquire more and more and more. That's the history of empires. Um, and where else do we find fugues? Well, we find them in Spencer's sonnets, uh, the Amoretti, um, notice, notice the, um, the rhyming sequence, A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, B, C, D. It's just like the Fibonacci sequence and it go on infinitely. You have only 14 lines in the sonnet, so you impose closure. You have a couplet at the end, E, E. But if you didn't put that E, E at the end, it'd just go on forever, right? Which is very tiring. Um, but there you go. Um, now, what else do we have? Well, we have Fred James Joyce. Uh, he wrote the uh, Sirens episode of Ulysses as a fuga per canonum, and the entire novel, of, of course, is a fugue on Homer's Odyssey, okay? It's, it's in dialogue with Homer's Odyssey, so the entire novel by Joyce is a fugue. Um, oh, Calvino is very interesting, Italo Calvino. Um, and the cover of uh, the English edition of Invisible City is very interesting. There's the Fibonacci sequence in a shell. You oh, see how shells make? That's the Fibonacci sequence. Hmm? And look who we got here. Our friend from down the street, Mr. Escher. Hmm? Okay. Um, he used combinatorics. He called it combinatorics. You just combined ideas to produce a novel. Also in the Castle of Cross Destinies. Um, the inexhaustible iteration and permutation of elements and themes having a reticular, or you could say recursive structure. So we find these things all over, and of course, we do find them, especially uh, in this very, very, very important work uh, by Escher, uh, one that I think haunts the 20th and 21st centuries, um, a work that is really in many ways inescapable. Um, 
Escher is, of course, for Hofstadter, the prime mover of the strange loop. Um, implicit in this idea is infinity, uh, that these loops can go on forever, and which hand is drawing which hand. Uh, you also find it in artworks such as Velasquez's uh, La Maninas. Um, I'm sure you know that great work from the Prado. Uh, what's interesting is, oh, let me just go back a second here. It, very hard to see here, but there are some artworks at the back of the studio, and the title is Metamorphoses, and that's the title of the Escher drawing you saw a moment ago, okay? So I wonder if Escher was in fact making an allusion to Velasquez. Um, Foucault, of course, Michel Foucault was obsessed by this painting, as you know, in Les Mots et les Choses, he writes about it. Um, perhaps there exists in this painting by Velasquez the depiction, as it were, of classical representation. That is, the whole idea of imitation is being pictured in Las Meninas. So what Velasquez is picturing is not the royal family. He's picturing the end of a particular moment in art, namely representing something out there. Okay, and Foucault is suggesting that art from this moment on will simply no longer be representational. It will in many ways be performative of the question of art uh, itself. Um, the definition of the space it opens up to us, representation freed finally from the relation that was impeding it can offer itself as representation in its pure form. The relation that was impeding it, of course, was the relationship to what's outside. Now art is finally free because it can focus on art itself. Uh, music is fugal, of course. So you, you can't give a lecture in this part of the world without having Vermeer uh, present, as we know. And this is a wonderfully recursive, it's, it's staggeringly complex, <coughs> this work. We have, we have a representation of music. We have artworks of different sorts. We have artworks on the uh, spinet or clavichord, and we have the player not looking at music, but looking out at us, okay? Fascinating work. Um, so Bach is a great crossover figure in music. He's, he's both the cathedral and the sepulcher of Western music. Uh, it sort of ended with him, 1685 to 1750. Um, after that, you know what? Um, Hofstetter compares Bach to Escher through the conjunction of canons in their works. Bach's of the musical sort and Escher's pictorial, as in his crab canon. Okay? Now this brings us back to dialogue. I said we would come back to dialogue. Um, Hofstetter understands Bach's works uh, as dialogues, and in many ways they are musical dialogues. And when you listen to, I don't know, um, many, many of his works, it's as if the instruments are having a sort of conversation with one another because there's both repetition and change. Um, Hofstetter says that Gordelescher Bach is structured in an unusual way as a counterpoint between dialogues and chapters. So the sense here is that dialogues are set up by a Hofstetter as a dialogue between two individuals. Uh, and the chapters are monological. They're simply the voice of the author. Uh, the purpose of this structure is to allow me to present new concepts twice. First metaphorically, then as an intuitive background. When I began writing dialogues, I somehow connected them up with musical forms. Eventually, I decided to pattern each dialogue on a different piece by Bach. Now, this is the point that Kurt Gödel um, enters the picture, a great mathematician. Um, just as the Bach and Escher loops appeal to very simple and ancient intuitions, a musical scale, a staircase. So this discovery by Kurt Godel of a strange loop in mathematical systems has its origins in simple and ancient institutions, namely the liar paradox, as in all Cretans are liars. Cretans are people from Crete. You know, all Cretans are liars. 
well then, where's the truth if all Cretans are liars, okay? Uh, this is the paradox of self-referentiality of repeating forms that question the closure of formal systems. A system cannot prove uh, itself. You have to go outside the system if you want proof, but then you're in another system. Poor old Kurt Vogel. Um, Einstein used to carry him around in his arms in the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton because Kurt Godel at a certain point wouldn't eat. He thought he was being poisoned. He starved to death. Einstein would carry him from his office to home in what like this? To that. It's just a very strange story, but massive, massive intellect. Quite a story. Um, so we come back to, I'm not going to repeat this part, but except to, to quote uh, Schoenberg on Pierre Lunaire, Pierre, Pierrot Lunaire um, about speech song. Um, what does he say? Um, this is key. The goal is certainly in using Sprechstimme, uh, not at all a realistic natural speech. He does not want to imitate speech. On the contrary, the difference between ordinary speech and speech that collaborates in a musical form must be made plain. But it should not call singing to mind either. Okay? He wanted something in between. Uh, speech song, as I wrote it, comes back to this dialogue between Glenn Gould, you see on the left, and Arnold Schoenberg on the right. Um, but it's also a dialogue in my book between formalism and freedom. Um, Gould emerges in my book as a champion of formalism. Uh, Schoenberg of freedom. Schoenberg believed that his atonal system gave him maximum freedom because there was no closure. There was no harmony. There was nothing to close off his music. So he believed it was absolute uh, freedom. Um, in the current media context, uh, we find a lot of take up of both Schoenberg and uh, Gould. It's often said that Schoenberg, uh, for all of his achievements, is never performed. Well, he may not be performed in concert halls, but he, he, did, he did not write music for concert halls. I mean, his pieces are two minutes long. Okay, or a, a, a piano concerto that's eight minutes long and quiet. He wrote for the recorder, the, the re record, okay, so you can listen to it in your own room. He didn't write for concert hall. Gould hated the concert hall. He retired at the height of his career, okay, and never appeared in public again. He wouldn't even appear in Toronto in public. He only went out at night, okay? Um, and uh, he spent the rest of his life in the recording studio making music in the recording studio, but they both hated this idea of the big concert hall. Um, and now, of course, we have this as part of museum installations, these, these sonic uh, performances. Uh, you can find Schoenberg performed 170,000 times on YouTube, his violin concerto by Emily Hahn, brilliant performance. Uh, that's more than you can fit into many concert halls, 170,000 people. So Schoenberg was sort of looking ahead to another moment. His great opera, Moses und Tehran, he wanted part of it telephoned in. Okay? So he didn't want the, the performers to sing at all. He wanted actually speakers and to have the voices telephoned in. It's still not been performed in that way, but he, he did want it that way. Again, forward-looking, really quite brilliant. Gould, as I said a moment ago, spent his entire life uh, in the recording studio after he retired in 1982. Gould was terrified of flying. He did it twice. Uh, he performed in the Soviet Union after World War II, the first North American uh, to do so, even before Van Cliburn. Uh, it was very, very, very um, courageous of him because he didn't tell them that he was also going to perform. They wanted him to perform Bach. He did, but he didn't tell them he also performed Schoenberg, and they got quite angry at him because, of course, that was decadent music, but the students loved it. Um, and, uh, but at the, the end of his career, he gave his last, what, what everyone thought was his last concert in Chicago, but then he did get on a plane. Gould was terrified of flying, and he flew to Los Angeles where he did give his last concert in a wonderful theater that's still on Wilshire Boulevard called the uh, Wilshire Bell Theater. And when I was writing my first book on 
Marshall McLuhan, I have a whole section on Gould, and I went down to LA, and I went into that theater, and there was a massive portrait of Arnold Schoenberg. And at that moment, I knew why Gould has ended his career in Los Angeles. It was to say goodbye to Uncle Arnold, okay? Uh, and then he went back to Toronto and never appeared in public again. Um, now, the amazing thing, you know, people say that Gould was one of the greatest performers of Bach on the keyboard, but Gould is not performing. You've never heard Gould perform Bach. The Gouldbergs of 1955 have 282 outtakes. So they're made of splices. Gould is not playing. This is what's playing. Okay. He never ever made a recording without um, splicing. They're all electronic. Is not, the human is not playing. We're post-human now uh, with Glenn Gould. This is a bit, just a bit about uh, what, what Gould writes about, visual space versus acoustic space. The reason he retired from the concert hall, he said, because it's visual space, but I produce music. I, I want to be in acoustic space, and you can have acoustic space in a recording studio and on a record. So that was his reason for retiring from the stage. Uh, we can also make connection between Schoenberg and media, as I was mentioning a moment ago. Uh, Karl Shorsky's great book, Fin de siècle Vienna, has a chapter on Schoenberg, and he writes that um, Schoenberg's abandonment of tonality was a political act that manifested itself profoundly in Sprechgesang, his agitated free verse, part speech, part song, part simply cry. As you know, of course, Schoenberg had to flee the Nazis. He ended up in Los Angeles. Um, and part of what he was doing with atonality was, of course, rejecting a system, a musical system that he felt had become tainted um, so that's what Shorsky means by uh, a political act. It, it was very, very, very political. And once you abjure tonality, once you put aside tonality, you enter into pure sound. You move from art to media. So that parallels what Foucault is writing about in terms of the movement from pictorial art to self-referential art. I like the name of this wonderful transformer, Pure Sound. You know, because that's, that's where we are now. And that's what Schoenberg was aiming for. Schoenberg composed his music using slide, musical slide rules. He made these. Okay? That's how he composed his music. So he's not sitting there. It's not about inspiration. Uh, it's not a, even about expressionism. It's about the mathematical relationships among the notes. So he made these himself. You can see them in the Schoenberg um, Museum, which moved from Los Angeles a few years ago back to Vienna. Um, and he was able to move these along and produce his music. I'm now just going to go into a counterpoint. I want to talk about artificial intelligence. And uh, I just last night found this wonderful cover from The New Yorker uh, of a couple of weeks ago, um, taking off uh, the famous Escher uh, with, this, with this hand. Uh, this is an artwork by um, an American artist, um, whose name I wrote down here somewhere, uh, Juhi Yoon, Y-O-O-N, it's called Drawing Hands with AI after M.C. Escher. So this will bring us, this is quite a, quite a smart drawing, it also honors the, the, um, the legacy of Escher, uh, but it's quite smart in, in terms of Gotel Escher Bach because it alludes to um, this whole question of AI, computational media. Um, what's computational media doing in this book? Well, for Hofstetter, computers by their very nature are the most inflexible, desireless, rule-following of beasts. Fast though they may be, they are nonetheless the epitome of unconsciousness. That's my major disagreement with Hofstetter. I do believe computers are conscious. Um, we are conscious. But we are the only consciousness we know. So I can't say computers don't have a consciousness. I don't know that they don't have them. So I'm not going to say they're un, that they're unconscious. For all I know, I'm unconscious. I mean, McLuhan said we dream awake. Um, most of my students are unconscious. Um, but that's another story. Um, but I would not say that computers um, 
lack consciousness. I, I would say that they have a different form of consciousness, okay? They certainly have an awareness. Um, mine turns on when I walk towards it. It turns off when I walk away. It is able to communicate without me with other computers doesn't ask my permission, it just does so. Um, it's able to correct my errors, it's able to talk to me. Uh, I would not say it's unconscious. I would say it has a different form of conscious. I think what's happening with AI is two consciousnesses are merging, okay? And we, ours may not be the better of the two. I don't know, but it's my one disagreement with Hofstetter, okay? Um, what he wants to do in the book is to confront the apparent contradiction head on so that in the end the reader might emerge with new insights into the seemingly unbreachable gulf between the formal and the informal, the animate and the inanimate, the flexible and the inflexible, and I would add Douglas, the conscious and the unconscious. I think that's another binary that he could have used. Um, Hofstetter was actually a bit prescient in reading Turing. No one really started reading Turing until relatively recently, I think thanks to Friedrich Kittler. But Turing, as you know, invented the computer uh, during World War II in Bletchley Park as a way to um, decipher the Enigma code. Um, it being used, being used in the war um, and, and it simply needed to speed up the process and so more or less invented the computer. Um, and he has a, a very famous article called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. What I find interesting about that essay, I, I think most of the essay is a joke. I mean, how can you tell a man from a woman? How can you tell a computer from a human being? I think uh, it's a bit of a joke, but I think the key point is how Turing thinks in this article and how he thinks is dialogically. He sets up an idea and then puts it away and comes up with another idea, okay, repeatedly. Um, he flips questions around repeatedly. Um, and uh, he does this in a way that I associate with the flip-flop switch. Okay, the flip-flop switch is what makes your computer work. It's what shifts you from zero to one, off to on, okay? And uh, this is the way that uh, uh, Turing thinks in this particular essay. He flips and flops questions around. Um, and the point, I think, is that computational media like Atone music and like the drawings of Escher are dialogical, comprised of off-on configurations produced by flip-flop switching. My favorite word in German is Wischenraum. Um, I translate it very badly as, as swishing room, where you swish around from idea to idea, um, which is very, very, very redolent of um, oral culture. Um, where I come from in Vancouver, British Columbia, we, we have a very large indigenous population and it's a part of uh, British Columbia that has been populated by indigenous people for 15,000 years uh, because we know that from the artifacts and indigenous people are still there, they're very present on, on my campus and they have a library and the name of their library is Shishwa. Shishwa. oral tradition. Beautiful, isn't it? It's the wind, the wind going through the trees. It's beautiful. Okay, so um, Gurd Lesherbach is, is similar uh, in this way. Uh, remember, uh, Hofstadter, as he tells us, if you read about Hofstadter, he's producing this thing on a computer. I think that's absolutely significant, very, very important. He's producing the book on a computer. Gurd Lesherbach is a computer effect, okay? It's not really a book. Uh, I don't think there's anyone on earth who's read all 800 pages, okay? Uh, it's not a book design, it's like Finnegan's Wake, okay? It's not meant to be read. Um, or that wonderful book you have down in the library by Schmidt. You know, it's not meant to be read, it's meant to be experienced. It's, it's the performance of a book, okay? Um, it is almost impossible to imagine that the body in which the, an AI program is housed would not affect it deeply. Uh, this is a remarkable, a remarkable sentence because it is Hofstetter's opening to the idea that AI is potentially embodied. In other words, that at a certain moment in history, we might ourselves begin to embody artificial intelligence. And I make one little caveat, all intelligence is artificial. The, the term is incorrect. My intelligence is artificial. I mean, there, there's no such thing as natural. Intelligence is learned. The word comes from reading between the lines. 
like an intellectual, intellector, intellectore, reading between the lines. So all intelligence is artificial. I just think it's intelligence, you know. Um, one big gap, I think, uh, in Gurlesherbach is derives from Hofstetter's focus on uh, DNA. The golden braid is really DNA, okay? Um, and the problem with DNA is that um, the people, who came, Watson and Crick, who came up with the idea of DNA, uh, had no way of understanding how cells communicate. How does one cell communicate with another? And scientists are only getting around to this now. Um, I read a wonderful book uh, called We Are Electric, published this year by Sally Adi. Um, and it talks about now all of the innovations in science and medicine. And I know one of the focuses of this particular uh, exhibition is on medicine. And there are medical applications of recursion. And this is one of them, because guess what? Our, each cell is a little computer, okay? And it's sending messages right now in my body and in your body. It's sending all sorts of messages electrically. So we're now beginning to speak of no longer about the biome, but the electrome as the heart of our body, that our bodies are now being understood as computers, as Paul Davies suggests in The Demon in the Machine. A full understanding of life will come only from unraveling its computational mechanisms. Okay? So I'm going to conclude very, very briefly. I'll conclude briefly, no more than five minutes, just with a little coda. Um, coda is what you often have at the end of a musical composition, a fugal one, to tie it up, to impose closure. And that's what I've got to do now because I can't go on forever. Okay? Um, so, um, more or less, I've said all of that. Recursion, any mathematical projection will always exceed itself as a result of the system through which it comes into being, which is more or less um, Gödel's theorem. Uh, Bach Goldberg variations um, are a um, recursive dialogue. You know that there are 32 variations of an aria that's played at the beginning and an aria, the same aria is played at the end. But the interesting thing is you can't hear that aria in the same way after you've heard 32 variations on it. It sounds different even though the notes are the same. Uh, so that's a recursive structure uh, in action. Um, Schoenberg took the notion of recursion to the extreme in musical terms, inverting the entire Western musical tradition and arguing that it was dissonance and not harmony that structured it. Um, this is the principle of the fugue, variations on a theme that are mathematically infinite as Bach's art of the fugue, which has no ending. That's Bach. It doesn't end. When Glenn would play this, he would come to the end and he would hold his hand up in the air like this to show you that this is not ending. He could not bring his hand back down to the keyboard. Okay? So even Bach could not end a few. He can end a few by producing a coda if he wants to. Okay? And the last point is, of course, we're sort of fugal ourselves. We are produced by uh, the computational interactions of our 40 trillion electronic cells. Thank you very much. Do you, want to take, do you want to take this one? No, do you have one? Yes. Hi. Uh, maybe the um, uh, question is, um, is dialogue with three parties still dialogue? I don't think so. You're thinking trilogue, dialogue? So, I mean, people do speak of a trialogue, but I think the, the, you wouldn't have, unless two people were talking at once, right? So there'll still be a dialogue, won't it? I would think. Is that where you're going with the question? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know where I'm going, but um, I was just thinking in this dual, dualist way.
way, yeah. and if you really see it in a spatial way. Um, yeah, yeah I see I see versions see. of dialogues. I would not say a dialogue is two words. Another mm -hmm. month is dialogos, two logos. Okay, two words, dialogue. So it's actually, it's not um, a dual in that term. It undermines that duality by making it an infinite loop. It, goes, they, it just goes on forever. It's, it's like the, more like the Fibonacci sequence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, hi. I was just, when I listened to all that, um, I had like a general question in my head uh, about like a philosophical question, mm -hmm. yeah, because it sounds like we're talking here about mathematics is actually the base of everything and you can see it in nature, you can see the music and so on and so on. Uh, and if everything's kind of like mathematics in a way, um, I feel almost like the, the, the way that it went to today where it's about AI a lot, and we're talking about looping and self-referencing, uh, and basically that we are creating again ourselves in, a, in an artificial form, although you said everything's artificial, but in a different new form. It feels almost like, almost like it's inevitable that, like it had to come to this point no matter what, because it is kind of like almost natural or artificial, as you want to put it. But then I ask myself, because a lot of times they talk about Oh, if this would have not happened, and you're just doing something small in in the linear, right? Then suddenly something else could not happen anymore. So, yeah. for example, uh, if someone would have killed Hitler back then, what would have happened, right? But this feels almost like no matter what we would do, AI was like something that had to happen anyway because it's a natural process. So I wonder how you. Bring these two together. Well, the one word I pick up on in your comments is the word linear. Yeah. Okay. I think what Gödel-Escher Bach is trying to do is teach us another way of understanding, which is circular, recursive. Uh, so, in the recursive model, um, you you move away from questions like what if you know what if X was murdered, Y wouldn't happen. There's a wonderful novel by Jose Saramago where a scribe takes the word not out of the Bible as he's writing it and changes all of history, okay? Uh, that's very linear, and the point is he's a scribe, he's writing. But once you move out of the written world, out of the written model, into a recursive world, which is the one we live in now because it's made out of electric circuits, um, then these questions have to be asked in a different way. Uh, I mean, it's like entering into a world where of all possibilities. You know, you you know, so there's so much fiction today where you do go into these worlds where I forget the name of the sort of fiction. Uh, you know, the what if what if that happened sort of fiction. We're we're now okay with this, right? We we sort of say, we say, we accept the possibility of multiple worlds, multiple universes, the multiverse. It's a different sort of philosophical philosophical. But then not in every multiverse the AI could happen, right? Although it feels very natural that it happened. Well, I don't know if it's natural. Um, it may be artificial. As I said a moment ago, I think all intelligence is artificial. Nature may be artificial as well. I mean, um, if, that, if that shell can be produced by the Fibonacci sequence, right? That's very strange, isn't it? Very strange. Is it natural or artificial? God is in some places called the great artificer, the great maker of artifice, which is the world we live in, right? Um, maybe we live in an artifice. I mean, nature is no longer nature now, we know that. In the Anthropocene, it's all human. Babies are born with plastic in their body, right? So we now live in a totally artificial world. The earth is human. The air is human. The water is human. Right? In other words, it bears signs of human intervention, the Anthropocene. It means it's an artificial world. For better or worse. Yes? But the government just as well say that we, we are nature. And we are trying to do That's a very interesting way of putting it. We have sort of become nature, but in doing so, we've turned it around. We've turned it inside out, right? 
So by becoming nature, we've made nature into artifice. Or if you will, we've turned nature into culture. You know Shakespeare's Tempest, one of his last plays. Um, Shakespeare writes a play about a magician on an island who turns the island into an artifice, and that's where we are now. I mean, it's just he makes it into this magical world, right? I'm also adding to the thinking of the really ancient symbols on, on, on the tombs, or yes, you know, they are spirals. Yes. And this is all, yeah, this is a symbol of spiral. Yes. Yes. It's, it's super old. It's or the labyrinth, right? Exactly. Yes. Is it like a mirroring of yes. culture, the nature in us, or is it culture in nature? Yes. We're in the labyrinth again yeah. of our own making, and we need to find a way to get out. Uh, yeah, I have uh, a, a, maybe a kind of personal question. Like uh, when you uh, showed your quotes and your slides, I'm very enthusiastic by most of them. Uh, I'm very fascinated by generating image by some kind of system or algorithm or uh, generating stories. Uh, and I dream of it, and I like to, and I, I like what people's doing it. But uh, somehow, with uh, the scale of the current AI, uh, somehow the joy is gone, or uh, it, it loses its charm. And um, like if you show the system of Schoenberg with his slides, but it's it is such it, it's his personal way of dealing with. Uh, with, with systematics and and now it seems to be gone. Like maybe when I was a designer I started pasting things down and was dreaming of a perfect system to to create two lines perfectly fitting to each other and now with the desktop publishing it suddenly uh, was kind of has another scale and became perfect and boring. And and it's, it threatens to go in the same way with these, uh, yeah, where it goes now, or even if you are yeah, related to that. So what to do? Uh, I, I think it needs kind of, still needs a kind of author. Oh, sure. And, um, and, and kind of handwriting yeah. like aspect. Yeah. I mean, I think the joy has been taken away. That is, I, I don't think doing AI or, or the sort of things you do, as a, as a designer, um, are sort of have to be joyless. But let me speak from my own position as a university professor. All of my colleagues are terrified by ChatGPT because they think it will write the students' essays. Okay. First of all, it can't. Second of all, it does a better job anyway. I mean, my students can't write. I, I teach a class of 150. They're largely illiterate. Okay. Uh, I mean, writing is over. Isn't it true? Writing, writing is an old system. I think the joy has been taken away. Who's taking away the joy is the question I would ask because, ask because I think there's huge artistic potential in AI. And uh, to work with AI, I mean, it's another universe that is all got, but who is taking away the joy? Well, I would answer in the same way. Who's taking away the joy of learning from my students? And I would answer the university, okay? Teaching is now joyless for my students. They hate it, okay? And they should hate it because it's awful. I hate it, okay? But someone has taken that joy away. Someone's taken it away. And I think the same thing with AI. Who is it who wants to control AI and in doing so, take the joy away? I think it is a political question that you're asking, okay? That's, how, that's the only way I can answer. Ravid, you got a question? Yeah, it's going to be a bit long, but I'm stuck in the uh, recursive. But it can be difficult. Huh? No, 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 no. It's, 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 an, it's an open question. So <laughs> I, it's a little bit of a thing. But okay. I was stuck on the first uh, comment that you had on, on dissonance and non closure. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, in, in, in this theory, it makes, it makes sense, mm -hmm. uh, but also in an ontological sense, it, it makes a lot of 
sense because it allows non closure allows for other emergencies. So the idea of closing something that allows for the possibility of continuation, of course, is something that we would be interested in uh, going into. Now, the strange thing about the dissonance is that large, the, the opening up, the spatial metaphor is things that are expanding. But in fact, uh, dissonance requires smaller acoustic spaces in order to hear the non-closure. So the reason that Schoenberg wrote for the phonograph meant that you would listen to it in a smaller room with 1.4 seconds reverb, uh, that you would hear the difference. So there's a strange contradiction that starts to emerge between an idea of openness that then encloses in smaller and smaller spaces, terrestrial spaces. Now, bear with me here. If we take this then uh, into this concept of the loop uh, and the recursion, in Akiem's presentation, the, 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 this drawing of Jan's mouth is at a time, a historical moment, when uh, math is confronted by experimental psychology and electrophysiology coming in. And electrophysiology only coming in because physics is moving from an atomist idea of materials to an, to an ontology of energies. It's a massive transformation in the sciences that uh, Ernst Math tries to resolve through defining a new realm called Elemente, where he says there, the finger that points at the news of the news and the news itself, uh, any one of those is correct, and in fact, pointing through into nothing is correct as well. Um, but depending on how you arrange those elements, you'll either get an insight or an outside, you'll either get a subject or an object, or you'll either get an, an idea or um, an environment. So if we take that then to the geometries of, uh, of the physiology of the body in um, Angela Merkel's cube, which in fact, geometrically speaking, is a recursive, but with four corners, why do, uh, and, and you look at uh, Kurt Gödel's image that you had, which are the gridic hands opening out to the space. Yes. So you have, um, you have the geometry of power, and you have the geometry of thinking embodied within uh, the physiology of the body. Now, the moment you talk about, I'm bringing it back now to the question in art, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a dangerous one, or it's a careful one that needs to be kind of assessed. If the, the dissonant loop is the one which allows for emergence, it's the one that we should, the one that gives joy rather than takes it away, um, isn't though there another loop that's the insular loop, which is the moment, and I'll take an example only from music, the moment where art is free finally to deal with itself, uh, there's a contested category of music that comes up uh, in classical tradition, which is absolute music, which is music that in dealing with itself loses its terrestrial horizon. So what's the relation between insular loops and dissonant loops, and could it have something to do with the geometries of looping squares versus looping circles, or where would this go? Uh, with recursion, with your, in terms of recursion? Well, I mean, in terms of the small room that Schoenberg's music is written for, no, notice how small those rooms have become for earbuds. Okay? Now, what happens with the earbud? You and I talked about the earbud the other day. Okay? Yeah. You're telling me we're now getting three-dimensional sound with the earbuds, etc. Notice this being opened up, not made smaller. Okay. Um, so, it went right to the small earbuds, and now it's opening up. But what I argue about um, the earbuds, it, when you have them in, it makes your body in a total feedback loop. Okay? It's like John Kelly with the flotation tank. When you're in a flotation tank, by the way, anyone who wants to do flotation, um, uh, I think we'll take you downstairs right now and put you in the tank. You can float in there, it's very nice. You know? When you're in a flotation tank, and you're not touching anything, you're in the water, you're, you're a total electronic system, it's like being in an airplane, okay? You're a total electronic system. I mean, uh, that's what Kelly uh, Lilly was um, inventing, and it's the same with our bodies. That's what the cells are. It's exactly the same thing. These little, these little containers of water, uh, electrolytic water, okay? 
Same thing. So I would say to you, look, what, look, look, let's look what you've got, and this is where Angela's hands come in. You've got this massive system of the concert hall coming down to Schoenberg's room, coming down to earbuds, okay, and then opening up. That's what you've got. Okay, so I would like to thank you very much for this uh, like a wonderful talk. And I think we will all have a drink. We have tables where there's more questions. I think everybody's welcome. And uh, it, was, it was also interesting to just mention the flotation tank uh, because uh, we also have uh, one uh, a visitor here who just had the session, so everybody was uh, curious about what's happening <laughs> within the flotation tank. Perhaps he's willing to uh, tell you a little bit about the experience. Yeah, thank you.